Good morning, Coda Church. If you are joining us this morning, we know God has a reason for it. We have a great worship experience coming up as well as part three of Pastor Mike's four-part series, 2022-101. But before we get started, we have just a few announcements for you. The Code at Men's Ministry is hosting a men's breakfast here Saturday, February 26th in the Family Life Center at 8.30. If you haven't been to one of these events before, we want to give you one piece of advice. You better come hungry. These men know how to cook an amazing breakfast and their time of fellowship and sharing the word is something that we know can be beneficial and important to all men. So mark your calendars and get yourself signed up on the website covenantchurch.church or our official church app. <laughs> missed it we have the newest vision 2022 shirts in the covenant store this shirt features the 2 not 10 graphic on the front and the covenant badge logo in the back we have sizes small through 2x and they will be available in the lobby after each service for only $15 and just so you know once these shirts are gone they're gone for good so make sure you go and get one today Saturday is the student ministry hosting of the dodgeball tournament and we need you guys even if you're a student or even if you're older it's just 12 and up we need to get you and your friends to create a team and join all the details for this and you can get signed up ASAP on our website or the church app we'll see you guys there
Oh, man, God is good. Man, thank y'all for being hungry. Thank y'all for being hungry. I watch you guys every single week, you hungry people. And I want you to know it inspires my soul when I stand and worship with y'all every week. I'm grateful for our worship team and, and the, the effort that they put in to not just lead worship on Sunday mornings, but to be worshipers. Because uh, if, if they just did it on Sunday mornings, you would be the first to know it. Well, you'd be the second to know it. The first to know it would be the spirit of the living God, but you'd be the second to know it because the anointing that comes off the stage is absolutely ridiculously good sometimes. And so I appreciate you being hungry. Uh, if you, I need one of you strong guys to bring that thing over here. Uh, either one. Josh, there we go. We got it. Thank you, brother. So, a story be- before I lead into uh, what God's going to do today. Uh, so, I was saying I appreciate y'all's hunger. Um, this past week, um, oh, go ahead and get your, wait a minute. Let's have a little time out. Get your little bread thing ready just in case for later, right? It's not, you got to have a degree to do this. So in my, in my small group this past uh, Thursday night, we were just talking about the move of God that's happening in all of them. It's just ridiculous. We got, we were supposed to have like, I think, 12 people in a small group. I think ours is up to like 18. But uh, it's turned into its own church. Uh, but we were just talking about how exciting. And one of the newer people in the church, and I won't say any names whatsoever today, but they said, man, I'm just so hungry. Like Pastor Mike, I can't really dance or anything, but I... And I was like, what? It's like, like Pastor Mike, I, I really can't dance all that good, but I'm going to worship God with all that I am. And I thought, how did I get looped into that you can't dance part? You know what I'm saying? Because I think I dance pretty good up here before the Lord, you know. Anyway, um, this series, uh, it's only three weeks long. Uh, I had every intention of starting a seven-week series in the, in the book of Numbers and uh and just like abruptly, the Lord stopped me and took me back to just some simple parts of the gospel that just really just stopped me on my tracks. And, and the debate for me became then, am I actually going to really go out here and preach this for three weeks, knowing that there are people in this congregation that know twice as much about what I'm talking about as I do? And last week, I talked to you guys about reading, how important it was to read the Bible and how important it was to pray. And, 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 I, and I felt almost in my spirit like a duh, you know, like we already know that. But anyway, what my, my point and reason for doing that is, is, is simply this. Uh, I believe God's called us to, uh, as a church to raise up warriors this year. I mean, like warriors. And sometimes what I learned when I was coaching ball all the time was that sometimes when you're not getting it right way out here, that sometimes the problem isn't what you're doing way out here. The problem is by what you're doing way back here. And so oftentimes I would go back to just fundamental things. Uh, if you, no matter how good you get, if you're Michael Jordan, I, I promise you Michael Jordan practiced dribbling, you know, before games. It, it's not like you, you, don't, you don't need those things to accomplish the feats that God has called us to way out here. And so I, I felt like God just really wanted me to have this like a renewed challenge to the church. Uh, because if you're going to be warriors, you're going to be in intimate fellowship with the Father. And by the way, you were created for that. Then you were... Uh, you're going to need to have some time every single day in the Word of the Lord. And I don't want it to be like uh, a checklist of things. I don't want it to be like, oh, if we don't read the Word of God, God's not going to be happy with us, and Pastor Mike's going to talk about us. You know, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. It's just what I hope happens is this internal thing happens inside of you where you desire to read God's Word every single day, uh, and not just to know about the Word, not just so you'll know the Word. There are plenty of people on the earth that know about the Word that don't know the author of the word. And, and I want you to read it from a perspective of, of, of sincerely desiring to know the author of the book. And, and I think if you begin to read it like that, you, 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 you glean his, what, what his heart intention is with every single sentence. And, and you'll see God's mercy and grace throughout the whole book. I also think praying is just as important. And today we're going to talk about fasting. You're like, oh, Lord, 
Should have given me a heads up on that. Well, I kind of did. At the end of last week, I said, we're going to be talking about fasting. So, uh, uh, anyway, all of these are for specific purposes. I did a, a, a series about a year ago, two years maybe, called the When You series. It's, and, it, and it was based out of Matthew 6, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. And, uh, and I know this, a lot of this sounds similar to that, but it's, it's, I just feel like I just need to reiterate the, the, the point and purpose of, of the simple things of the gospel. And so, um, I, you know, I'm always forever writing things down, right? I remember, y'all know I'm writing down like one-liners or paragraphs or things like that that I hear. This past week, I, um, I had one of those moments where I wrote something down and it took a whole paragraph to do it. And I didn't have any clothes that I was going to bring it up today. But it was a, it was a story uh, that was shared by a, a, a young black guy, like he was probably, I call him young, uh, a little like he was maybe in his 40s. Uh, and just from the video, it appeared that he might be either giving testimony about his relationship with his father or maybe even sharing a eulogy about his dad. And he goes into this, 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 these remarks that I, that I just found profound. And some of you guys have probably heard this before, but... But basically, he says this, talking, talking about a conversation that he had with his father toward the end of life. And, and, his, and his, his dad was telling him this. He said, your, your grandfather walked 10 miles to work. He said, and your father walked five miles to work. He said, but you'll drive a Cadillac to work. And your son will drive a Mercedes. And your grandson will drive a Ferrari. But your great-grandson, he'll walk again. And then he went on to explain why that from the dad's perspective. He said, because uh, tough times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. And so he says, son, whatever you do with your children, make them warriors. And I thought, wow, what a eulogy of, you know, what a, what a story. And, uh, and you'll probably have to think through it about 50 times like I did. <laughs> I thought through it so much I memorized it in my own mind. I was like, you got to be kidding me. This is incredible what he just said because I think it's, it's not a eulogy necessarily so much about uh, uh, one family, but I think it's the eulogy of America. And I think it's the eulogy of the church in America. I, I think that there were people uh, in our past uh, that fought some really, really hard battles to get us here. And I, and I think that, uh, that your grandfather probably had to battle more for his faith and for his income uh, than you ever did. I think if we're being honest, the testimony of our lips would be, my father battled in faith to some degree and certainly worked harder than I've ever had to and made life much easier for me than it was for him. And I will tell you this, my children have worked way less and have gotten way more uh, than I ever got in my lifetime. And, and I think, uh, and I, it's not just about my family, I think it's about your family as well, if you're willing to be honest, but I think it's more about the church as well. I, I, I think if we're being honest and we want to really get to the bottom of what's wrong with, with the culture of America, we have nowhere else to look or no better place to look than ourselves. Because one of the things that we've done is that we've let this get so easy that it become it be, it, we, we, we've, we've become very complacent in our spiritual journey. And, and it's shown everywhere. There's no other excuse for why many, many, I'm not talking about just hundreds of people. I'm talking about denominations of people can compromise the truth of the Scripture. If we've raised a generation behind us that has no moral compass, the reason, that the simple answer for why they have no moral compass is because we didn't give them one. We, we really didn't. If we raise kids that are liars, that's our fault. If we've raised kids that, are, that have, have no, no depth of understanding for what's going on politically or culturally in America, and, and I'll even say it this far, and I know it sounds mean and rude, but we have a whole lot of kids that were born with a silver spoon in their hand that are, that, are, that are taking our nation off the cliff because they don't know any better because we didn't raise warriors. We've raised pansies in a lot of ways. We've raised weak people because we did the hard work for them sometimes. 
And we've ne- we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like our kids getting cut from sports, so we just start teams where they can't get cut. We don't like them not getting the trophies, so we create teams where they don't get, nobody gets trophies. Oh, that's right. And that's what we've done. We've, we have dumbed down and weakened America, and it's our generation that did it. The greatest generation was only two generations for some of us one generation ago. And we went from the greatest generation, people who were willing to die for this country and, and die for their faith to a bunch of selfish people who, when I taught school for three years, I had a conversation with, with one, one year I had uh, like 63 students. And out of those 63 students, on one of our questionnaires that related to something I was teaching, I said, how many of you guys would be willing to go to war for America and die for our country? Do y'all know that only two kids out of 63 said they would die for our country? If they'd asked that question in my senior class, we'd all win. I'm in. But that's not those kids' fault. By the time you get to the only the two, it's time to quit blaming just the two. It's time to blame the generation before them. And see, I think God wants to raise up warriors. Now, that's just why this is important to me. I think this is important because God's trying to say something to you and do something through you uh, like nobody on the earth has ever seen before. And he has drawn us back to real. See, God doesn't just want to do some stuff for you. God wants to do some stuff through you. On Wednesday night, I was sharing a scripture that actually just blows my mind. And the reason I'm sharing it again today is because... uh, it's just, and I shared even in our small group the other night, it's just absolutely, I've read the Bible through a number of times, and I read something in Scripture that I've never read before. So when Israel was coming out, and so if you've had to hear this twice, if you're in my small group, or if you're here Wednesday, just deal with this right here for a second, okay, because we've got a point that we're trying to make. Here's what I think. I think. I think, number one, let me preface this by saying this, God is desperately trying to do something through you, not just for you. Do you know that God could do stuff for you forever and never, and you never have a relationship with him? But the reason God wants to do stuff through you is because he wants you to know, number one, the power that you possess in him, the effect that you can make, the purpose of your life. But ultimately, it's for for intimate relationship. The reason I'm telling you about reading the Bible and praying, it's not just so you'll know more about the Bible, but you'll also know, you'll know more about him. The reason I'm encouraging you to be people who pray every single day is just not so you can say, hey, I pray, I got my list already, here's my check. No, it's, it's because so you'll know him intimately. The reason I'm going to challenge you in fasting is because I believe that God wants to speak to you, and some of us aren't quiet enough to hear him. So back to the scripture. Remember when Israel was getting released from their captivity in Egypt? And it looked like to me, if I read the story, if I'm reading the story correctly, and, and, and I'm just objectively reading it, it looks like to me that Moses, from a common, st- common sense standpoint, took, took them on the wrong route to get out of town. I mean, if you, just, if you just led thousands and thousands and thousands of people out of slavery, do you think it's a very good idea for you to take them to where a river crossing exists that you can't make? It's almost like he dead-ended them into a space at God's directing, I believe, where they had no way out but God. And so about the time they get to the space of the dead-end road, the the cul-de-sac that is (laughs) the river that they can't cross, they look in their rearview mirror, and uh, Pharaoh suddenly has decided that the people that he just two days ago ran off and said, please leave, and why are you going to bless me? I want to go kill them now. And so he gathers up his troops. These are the people with the weaponry. They're the people with the horses and the chariots. These are the people who can defeat the people who are, who are running with their backs to them very easily in the middle of, of the slaughter that is about to be, right? And, and when, when, when Israel looks over their shoulder and they see Pharaoh and his many armies coming, uh, they, they, they say something that they actually say a lot over the next 40 years. Uh, In fact, what their response to Moses was, oh, so there wasn't enough graves in Egypt, so you brought us out here for us to die. They immediately blamed somebody else, right? And so Moses, in return, looks to God and says, help. That's paraphrasing. Help. The the response from God is probably one of the most chilling and one I've missed a, a hundred times before. But God says to Moses, when he asked him help, 
in response to a nation that has turned on him already. Why are you bothering me with this? Why are you asking me? I've already given you what you need. I, th I think that's just amazing, but I think it tells the story of the heart of the Father. I think what he's trying to get across to Moses is this. Listen, I've already given you a staff. You watched what my staff did when the enemy threw his staff before me. My staff ate his staff. That should let you know that my staff is bigger. All right? My staff is better. My staff is more powerful. I've given you the tools. See, some of you guys don't know this, but you have been given tools to go do things you don't even know you can do yet, and you're, you're, you're kind of shrinking over in fear still saying, help me, God, help me, God, and God is in heaven going, I did. I did help you. I did help you. I have given you the gifts. I have given you the staff, as it were, for your life to go do the thing that I've called you to do. Now, let me tell you something. When they got through and, and, and Moses finally raised up his staff, y'all know the story, the river parts, they go across on dry land. The enemy comes into the riverbed and is drowned and killed and destroyed. And when they got to the other side, they stopped and said, thank you, Jesus. It's not like they didn't know that God was the responsible party for getting them across the river it's not like they thought Moses' staff did it they didn't stop and build an altar at the staff and go praise God praise staff praise you staff no they stopped and built an altar to God and said thank you that you did that right so what I'm telling you is some of you guys are carrying a staff around but every time something happens in your life you, you, you put the staff behind you and just ball up and die and God is saying listen I've given you what you need. One of your greatest issues is that you don't have enough communication with me to know what you have. Because we got people in the church, big people, grown-up people in the church, that every single time something goes wrong uh, in the church, they run to the back and they hide. And they're like, I, I, I just bought them, take my toys and go home. And God is saying, stop it. Amen. Grow up. Sit your tail down and listen to me. I'm trying to tell you something. I've given you a staff. I've given you a power. I've given you an authority. I've, give, I've given you a purpose and a reason and a meaning. But you're not in communication with me enough to know. You're worrying about everything peripheral around your life. And you're not in, in, in relationship with me enough to know the thing I'm really calling you to do. So that's why we go back to simple gospel. That's why we go back to reading the word of the Lord and getting the understanding of the heart of the Father. That's why we're going to go back and pray and build an intimate friendship. That's why we're going to learn to fast to put aside our desires and wants of our flesh so that we can hear the Father better. And I'll tell you why I believe it. Because I believe a lot of you guys, if not all of you, already have a staff in hand to do something amazing with your life. And it's time for us to be big boys and big girls and to listen to the voice of the Father and to say, what is it you want to send me to do? That's what warriors do. Warriors are people who listen to the Father. They walk out life of obedience. Obedience matters, y'all. Acts says that I will give my Holy Spirit to those who obey me. Obedience matters. Obedience matters. How you live your life matters. And God's trying to talk to us. He's trying to talk in a way like now like he never has before. And it's time for us to learn how to listen. And sometimes when you want to learn how to listen, you go back to, this, to the basics of your faith. And you get in the Word and you read it. And you get on your knees and you talk. You get on your knees and you listen. And you fast and you put aside stuff that's in the way. And you make your, 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 your what I call, make your river clean so that the presence of God can get to you easier. And that's why we're going to talk about fasting today. So I know there are a couple of different things that, uh, that, that we can learn about fasting that's important. Uh, I, I know there are times in Scripture where fasting is used as a weapon, as a tool uh, to beat something up. <laughs> I know that. I, I, know, I know what Matthew 17 says, and we'll actually quote that Scripture in just a minute, uh, where, where, God was, was, where I, Jesus was actually talking to some guys that were trying to uh, cast out a demon out of a guy. And, and he, uh, he said, the reason y'all weren't, weren't able to do that is because uh, you, some, some things will only be moved by prayer and fasting, right? So I know there's, there's some, some, some important parts to that, but here's, here's the real reason I feel like we're supposed to, to, to do that. 
uh, and I'm just going to read a quote that I wrote. Uh, actually, I read an a, a article in Guide Post Magazine, and this is where this sermon came from. I wrote, I wrote myself some notes about a year ago, uh, and I wrote this. Many view fasting as a spiritual duty, depriving ourselves for a period of time to prove our love. While long-suffering is a part of the journey, fasting is less about what we're, we're giving up and more about what we're making room for. So that's why this, this challenge I want to I wanna, I wanna bring to you today, I challenge you last week to be in, in the Word every day and to be praying every day. Uh, today, before we leave, I'm going to challenge you into a fast. Uh, and, and, and the whole point of it is that we might make room for Him. Some of us are so busy with stuff and life that we fail to make room for Him. And then we, we, don't, we don't know why we're going off the deep end sometimes with our life. It's because we're, we're failing to make room for him. So these are the five things I read in a guide post magazine. I'm trying to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and I'm going to try to go through them quick. And at the end of the time, we're, end of the day, we're going to share the cup together. Number one reason I believe for, uh, for, for you to, uh, important for you to make room is that it's a soul cleansing. All right? It's a soul cleansing. Our bodies are temples of the Lord. And fasting is a great way to remember the spiritual connection that we have to our physical bodies. As we give our, spirit, our, our, our earthly, our physical bodies a break from the, even the digestive system, we also will allow our spirits to be t- detoxed. Fasting is a faith move and expectation we have that God will fill us with his Holy Spirit because fasting cleanses the soul and makes room for the Holy Spirit in a new way. You're like, what, what, what does all that mean? It means this is that the Bible says in Galatians that our flesh and our spirit are always at war. That's, that's a war that will take place all the way between now and heaven. And, and every single week, one or the other is winning. And whichever one of those things is winning is the thing that's leading your life. If you feed your flesh and it gets big and strong, then you need to understand this. When your flesh is big, the spirit of God in you is smaller in its ability to lead and have authority over your life. If, if on the other hand, you choose to feed the spirit, man, the part of the Holy Spirit in you, the filling of the Holy Ghost inside this temple, if you feed it and you allow it to get big and broad and strong, it will actually start leading your flesh to right positions in the world. You understand that? That, that makes sense. The scripture that, that I picked out for this one is, is Matthew 2.22. No, no one's going to pour a new wine into an old wine skin. Otherwise, the wine will burst in the skin, and both the wine and the wine skin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. The reason some of you guys haven't gotten a revelation of what God is actually doing on the earth right now is because you're still carrying around an old wine skin, and God can't pour this new thing into that wine skin because it'll, it'll bust. It will be... Absolutely, it would, it, it, would, it would like defeat the purpose of him giving you purpose. So you, you create for God this, this space of, of refreshing heart, refreshing spirit, man. You, you, you set aside your heart and you make room for the Father to give you a new heart so that he can pour a new spirit in a new heart and guide you into new directions. God wants to pour out revival in America right now, but one of the things that's blocking that is not the the desire of the Father to pour revival in America. One of the greatest uh, battles that's going to have to be won is not a battle against Satan. It's a battle against religiousness in the church. Some of us, if God doesn't move how we think he should move, then that can't be God. We have a predisposed mindset of what God's going to do and how he's going to do it. Why? Because we're carrying around an old mindset. We're carrying around an old wineskin. If we will let God create in us a new heart, he can renew a right spirit within that heart. And if we'll let God give us a new wineskin, God can give us new vision and new purpose and new reason. If America ever needed a move of God, it is now. It doesn't matter if you're president of a church in Virginia or Lincolnton, North Carolina. We need a move of God in Lincolnton. They need one in Virginia. 
They need one in Los Angeles. They need one in New York. They need one in Denver, Colorado. They need one in Washington State and in Arizona. They need a move of God in, in Canada and Alaska and all these other countries all around the world. I know Alaska's not a different country. Don't get me. We, we need a move of God, right, y'all? Right? Well, let's, let's, let's prepare our hearts to be new wineskins so that we can get a vision for that. I think fasting will help. Number two reason for fasting is, is a good, good idea is it gives you a new desire for God. When we acknowledge through fasting that we need God to live and to live more abundantly, we can begin to desire God in a new way. He certainly wants a deeper relationship, and fasting can bring that to us. When we realize that we need God more than we need food, we can start to understand what the psalmist meant in the song that we sung a while ago. As the deer pants for living water, so my soul thirsts for you. There's one thing that that deer knew in that song. See, this is a story about a deer that was famished, that was on its last leg of the journey. And it's, it's been running almost, it's almost you can get a picture of this deer has been running for its life. And it finally comes upon this brook. And it says, and, and, and the psalmist David says, as that deer Pants for the living water. What is living water? It means the water that will bring me life. My soul thirsts for you. I'm like the deer. I, I, I know I'm on my last leg, and if I don't get to your stream, I can't live anymore. I will, I will spiritually die on this earth if I don't get to that water and drink it. See, the, the, the author of this article uh, b- believes, and I do too, that that we need to get to the part where, part where we can't live without him. You're like, what do you mean? We, we already know we, can, we can't live without him. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. Most, most of us, if, if it doesn't work out with God, we have a plan B on the back burner. When you get to the point where you have no plan B, then he is the only burner. See, churches in America, we can have church in America without God. We know how to do it. The main thing is, is that we reach enough people, get them in here, and get enough offering to pay the bills for another week. That's the mindset of the church in America. It's got to change. That's not why we're here. This right here is a stop off on your weekly journey to greatness. Every single week, what we're going to come together to do is, this is me coaching you and telling you and inspiring you and encouraging you. This is us worshiping together corporately so that when we go out, we win the world for Jesus Christ. This is us getting equipped to go out there and do something in Lincoln, North Carolina, or Virginia, or wherever we're going this week. This is our call. This is our place of, of, of preparation for action for tomorrow. Amen. So let's, let's, let's let him have it. How about we let him have it? How about we let him have our church service? How about let's not try to do church without him? How about let's not buy into some, some, some structure or something that we've created and call that church? How about we let church be him? He, 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 but he wants you hungry. And the only people that will let that happen is the people who say, I, I, I can live without every other thing, but I cannot live without you. I think fasting can help in that, in, that, in that search and understanding of that. Three, fasting can bring a deeper praise. When we fast, we have more time and energy to focus on other things. When we stop being consumed with the physical, we have more focus on the spiritual. This can bring us into a deeper consciousness of praise as we focus on all he is to us. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. See, we, we're really, really good at chasing our dreams that we think will make us happy on the earth. But what about the dreams God has for you? He said, listen, what, what happens is, just, is that fasting will actually bring within you a, a, a deeper praise. And cause a deeper understanding that he, he, he's, go, he's going to be my source. All, all my dreams really are going to be locked into what his dreams are for me. It will create in me a, a, a deeper praise and a deeper adoration 
for him. And I will tell you this, nobody in this room will ever be a warrior until you become a worshiper. Those things are so intertwined and connected, you know, that we, 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 we totally, listen, we, we, got, we got to understand this. Until you become a worshiper, I'll say it again, you will never be a warrior. I'm not talking about you standing up front during the music playing. I'm not even talking about the music playing. I'm talking about the heart in your life until you become a worshiper of the Father. You'll, you'll, never, you'll, you'll, you'll never be a warrior. You'll never be a warrior. You, you just can't be a warrior until you're a worshiper. Look at every warrior in Scripture. Every warrior in Scripture was a worshiper. Every, every great man or woman of God in Scripture was a, was a worshiper first and then a warrior. And it will be the same for you. Number four, fasting can give you a sensitivity to God's voice. Often while fasting, we're able to hear the voice of God more clearly. When we are consumed with a desire for God, we become sensitive to his voice. Like Jesus did, we were able to hear his voice and know what he wants us to do. Now, here's that scripture in Matthew 17, talking about the, the demon. However, this kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. See, we need, we need, to, we need to seek a life that has a greater sensitivity to the voice of God. You read the Word of God because that lets you know He speaks. You have a prayer life because that gives you an opportunity for Him to speak. You fast because you're making room in your, in your, in your mindset, in your spirit life, to hear Him. It's, what, what's happening is, is, your, is, is, is this creative moment happening with God's voice where he, he begins to create in you a, a pure heart and, and, re, and renew the right spirit within you. And your ears become clear. You, can, you get a, a new sensitivity of spirit and you begin to hear the voice of the Father. Amen. And then finally, the fifth thing is a new satisfaction will happen when, when, when you added, add fasting to your life. When you finish your fast, listen to me, renewed, full of energy, a new desire with a new praise and a sensitivity to his voice, you'll find that the absence of food was small in comparison to what you gained. When Christ's disciples noticed one day that he hadn't eaten all day, they tried to get him to slow down and take, uh, take, take, take a break and eat. Here was his response to them. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's somebody that, listen to me, y'all. You can say what you want to say about Jesus, but one thing that Jesus didn't have was a plan B. Jesus left himself no other option about what the future of his life held except what his father would speak. In fact, there's a scripture that says that Jesus only did what he saw his father right do. He, he, only, he, he lived his whole life in response to the voice of the Father. How, how did he do that? Did Jesus pray? Yes. Did Jesus fast? Yes. He, 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 he made room in his life for the Father. The Bible says that oftentimes early in the morning that Jesus would go out to meet his Father. You're like, that's God's son. He don't need to go out there and meet him. Well, if he does, then how much do we need? Amen. Right? Right? I'm not trying to put you in some kind of spiritual bondage either, y'all. Hear me. Where you're like, oh, my God, preacher, Mike's going to be talking about it because I didn't do this. No, I'm not. I'm not. I promise you. I'm trying to encourage you to this space, to this place, to create an environment in your life where the voice of the Father can speak to you because he wants to. I'm encouraging you by fasting to make room in your life for his voice. So here's the challenge. Last week it was... Make sure you're reading the word of the Lord every single day. All right? My challenge was make sure that you're having a prayer time every single day. So here's the deal with, the, with fasting. I don't care what you fast. It's not about what you fast. For me, it's going to be food because I, 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 can, I can survive without eating for a while. No, but seriously, some of you guys, maybe, maybe that, that's not what's going to be an allowance of your life. Maybe some of you are on common sense. You're on some kind of medication where you can't not eat a day. For me, it's going to be Wednesdays. I'm going to, I'm going to go from Tuesday night dinner to Wednesday night dinner. And I'm challenging you guys to pick a day 
every single week where you fast. And I will tell you this, you will, you will be absolutely dumbfounded with what happens in your life when you make room for the Father in a purposeful way. Not so you can say, I'm fasting. No, it's in Matthew 6. The conversation that he has with his disciples in Matthew 6 is, listen, when you fast, as if that was going to be part of their everyday regiment or every week regiment or every month regiment, he said, what, do you, what you need to do is be careful how you act during that. In other words, if, if don't come in here on Wednesday afternoon and say, Fasted all day today, Pastor. I'm dying. Because that's not true. And don't go to people at work and say, God, I wanted to go to lunch with y'all today, but I'm fasting for Jesus. You know, you ain't got to announce everything, right? Just quietly pursue the Father. Leave us new usual and go to lunch. And instead of going to Chick-fil-A or some other Christian organization, whatever y'all do, I don't know. Go to the park and just spend some time with the Father reading the Word or talking to Him. Mine's going to be Wednesdays. If all of us choose Wednesdays, I'll just give you an encouragement. Be careful. Because if all of us choose Wednesday and we all come in here on Wednesday afternoon hungry not for food but for Him, there's no telling what can happen here on Wednesday night. You might not get home till Thursday night. But I'm just saying. But I'm, but I'm telling you this without any shadow of doubt. If, if you will give God time and if you will make room for the Father, he will not disappoint you. He will respond. And I just think this is a spiritual discipline we're going to need to learn in the last days if we're going to be warriors. So what we're going to do, we're going to read his word, right? We're going to pray, and we're going to add fasting to our life. And I'm going to tell you something, if the outcome of you fasting one day a week and you getting in a relationship with God heals your marriage, praise God. Or if it heals your cancer, praise God. Or if you see somebody at Walmart with a demon and you cast it out, praise God. But the point is, it's just being available to him to do whatever it is he wants to do. Amen? Let me tell you something. Here's what I believe. I believe with all my heart. I want you to get your bread now. As a matter of fact, after you get your bread out, you can stand up because we're about finished. I, it's, it's not that I'm rushing through this because I'm really not. I just feel like we just going to stand in reverence to the Father. And I know you got your bread out when you stand up. If you need help from your neighbor to get your bread out, or if you need a pocket knife, Brandon's got one, I'm sure. But here, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to just, in your, in your heart, I want you to acknowledge this truth. That it is absolutely a fact that the body of Jesus was broken for my benefit, right? Did you know that it was broken? so that one of these days I could go to heaven. Heaven, there, there's not one thing in me, not one single thing in my whole existence that deserves to get to go to heaven. But Jesus was born to die because I couldn't. He did. So I have no doubt whatsoever as I hold my hands on this bread as a representative of his body that was broken for me that he bought my salvation. None. You? None. Right? But I also want you to know this. Not only did he purchase your salvation, but he purchased communication. You know, what does that mean? That means that Jesus dying on the cross opened up a way. His broken body makes it possible for me to be in not just an eternal relationship with him when I die, but an eternal relationship with him while I still live. Does that make sense? Because he died, because his body was broken for me, I can have conversation with him and he can have conversation with me. And if I'm going to be a warrior, communication is going to happen. Amen. And so today, Jesus, we celebrate, say it with me, we celebrate that you died for us. But we also celebrate that we have opportunity to have communication and conversation with you, prayer time with you. Oh, man intimate fellowship with you because your body was broken for me. So eat this in remembrance of him. Then Jesus told the disciples, open up your little cup. No, seriously. 
Not only was his body broken for me, but his blood was spilled for me. See, the only way the new covenant could be created is his perfect blood would be shed. But let me tell you a part of the new covenant. Sure, eternal life is part of the new covenant. But I need you to know that healing is part of the new covenant. I need you to know that God's encouragement, that God's purpose for your life is, is, is written into the code of the new covenant. And I need you to know that him speaking to you and you speaking to him is written into the code of the new covenant. You will never, listen, he said it. I will never leave you alone. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am yours and you are mine. So thank you for our salvation, Jesus. But thank you for our now too. Thank you for the privilege that we have as children of the living God to have a relationship with the living God. Thank you that your blood was spilled for me. And today, in obedience to your word, we remember you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all help me here.